Well, hello again. In this example, you will learn how to modify your degree of freedom orientations so that you will be able to include the effects of incline supports. We are being asked to use the matrix approach to find the joint displacements for the truss shown, and you'll notice that it has an inclined rower. Let's go ahead and label our degrees of freedom, considering the unrestrained degrees of freedom first. So I've got degree of freedom 1, degree of freedom 2, but I'm going to show you down here that I will rotate these degrees of freedom 3 and 4, 5 and 6, and I rotated these degrees of freedom down here to the lower left such that it was aligned with the rower support itself. Now, to handle those, the degrees of freedom are going to be handled as such in a generic fashion where this will be the beginning end of the member and this will be the ending end of the member. And if you do that I want you to pay attention to the transformation matrix here where this upper quadrant is based upon the orientation of the degrees of freedom associated at the beginning end and here is the orientation at the ending end. So let's look at member number one first. I want you to notice that these are the degrees of freedom that we have. 3, 4, 5, and 6. And so we get the proper orientation by rotating from the degree of freedom to the member itself. So look at this here. I'm going to rotate down here 30 degrees. And thus, I will label this as being phi b, so the beginning, is equal to negative 30 degrees. And then because there was no modification back here, here's kind of the projection of that member. Degree of freedom 5 and the projection of the member, they lie one on top of another. And so we will say that the orientation at the end of the member is 0 degrees. So now I can use this cosine phi of the beginning is equal to 0 0.87 sine phi at the beginning is equal to negative 0 0.5 cosine of phi sub b e is equal to 1.0 and sine of that end angle is 0 0.0 and so you will notice for member number one, you'll see how that was dropped into the transformation matrix. And then we were able to get the member stiffness matrix in the global degrees of freedom, three, four, five, and six, using this double transformation that I've got shown here. Okay, let's look at this for member number two. Well, member number two, here are the degrees of freedom. 3 and 4, 1 and 2. So you'll remember the beginning is where you go from the degree of freedom, rotate to the member, so that is a positive rotation. I label that as phi sub b. And what I do know is I know that from horizontal up here is 30 degrees. So if I know what this orientation is, and I can calculate that out to be 53.1 degrees, that would then give me phi of b is equal to 23.1 degrees. Now to get for the ending angle that I should be using, what I'm going to do is I'm going to project that member out, and I am interested in going from the degree of freedom up to the projection of that member, so I'll label that phi sub b, e, and that will be 53.1 degrees. So we've got cosine of that beginning is 0 0.92, sine of that beginning angle is 0 0.39, cosine of the ending angle 0 0.6 and sine of that ending angle is 0 0.8. I can drop that into my transformation matrix 
as such, carry out this multiplication, it will then give me for these degrees of freedom 3, 4, 1, and 2. So the final member that we are going to have to deal with has degrees of freedom 5, 6, 1, and 2. Remember what we would do. We would find the angle from the degree of freedom all the way to the member. So that is phi of beginning. I'll project that member out and I rotate from here to here. Phi of ending. And in this case, should be no surprise, those are the same because we haven't done anything weird with our degrees of freedom. I can do the computations on that and get these to be equal to 116.6 degrees. So cosine phi of b is equal to negative 0 0.447. Sine phi of b is equal to 0 0.894. And when we drop that into the transformation matrix, you will now notice that those are the same quantities that show up there. Here's that member stiffness matrix, 5, 6, 1, and 2. Those get dropped into a structure level stiffness matrix for these same degrees of freedom. And we will partition according to the unrestrained degrees of freedom. That would be right here. Giving us these matrices, 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And for degrees of freedom 1, 2, and 3, I need to assemble that force vector. So let's look back at the original picture. We have a 7 kips in degree of freedom 1, 21 kips in degree of freedom 2, and nothing in degree of freedom 3. So we've got 7 kips, negative 21 kips, zero kips, carry out this matrix multiplication and find we get 0 0.0703 inches, negative 0 0.1276, negative 0 0.0345, all of those are in units of inches, and then we use that to get our reactions where we plug in that displacement vector here, we compute these reactions, and if I actually sketch these on, here's what I get. Here's degree of freedom 4, and that is a positive 3.24 kips. Here is degree of freedom 5, and here's degree of freedom 6. Okay, now that's what the example was asking us for, but I just want to show you, and this is just more for your information right up here. We can then compute the member end forces the way that has been shown previously. Member one is in tension then. Member two is in compression. And member three is in compression as well. That concludes this example. As always, it is an absolutely beautiful day for studying structures.